His Excellency, Honorable Alex Chernoff, the Governor of Victoria and the Patron of the Australia India Institute, Mrs. Chernoff, Her Excellency, the High Commissioner of India in Australia, Mrs. Sujata Singh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, the Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Elizabeth Alexander, Robert Johansson, Chairman of the Board of the Australia India Institute and Deputy Chancellor, University of Melbourne, Professor Glenn Davis, Vice Chancellor, University of Melbourne, Professor Susan Elliott, Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne and Deputy Chair of the Board of the Australia India Institute, the Honorable Council General of India in Melbourne, Dr. Subhakan Behera and Mrs. Behera, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am Amitabh Mattu, inaugural director of the Australia India Institute, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to the Australia India Institute's annual oration. This is the second annual oration of the Australia India Institute. The first one, some of you will remember, was held in April 2010 and was delivered by the Honorable Minister for Human Resource Development of the Government of India, Mr. Kapil Sibyl. We are delighted and honored to have His Excellency Alex Chernow chairing this oration. And we're delighted that Dr. Shashi Tharoor, celebrated author, human rights activist, member of the Indian Parliament, will deliver this year's oration on Indian soft power in a globalizing world. The oration, many of you know, follows the Institute's inaugural conference, The Reluctant Superpower, Understanding India and Its Aspirations, which was the biggest conference on in India in Australia in recent years. May I now request His Excellency, the Governor, Alex Chernow, to introduce our speaker for this evening's oration. The Honourable Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Mrs. Sananda Tharoor, Mr. Robert, Robert Johansson, the Chairman of the Australia India Institute, Professor Matu, there are many other distinguished guests whom Professor Matu has read out, and you will not mind my not reading it out, reading your names out, otherwise we'll be here for a long time, and friends and colleagues. I'm delighted to be able to join you this evening in such distinguished company. And I can't really believe that 12 months have passed since I had the pleasure of hosting Australia in the Institute's inaugural lecture delivered, as the director has mentioned, by Capital Sybil. Unsurprisingly, it was an outstanding success. And the past 12 months have been very busy for the Institute, particularly since the appointment of Professor Matu as director in April of this year. Under his leadership, the Institute is continually increasing its program and expanding, expanding its network to deal with broader cross-sections of interest to the two countries. It's a credit to the Institute that it has fitted this important oration in its annual calendar. As with last year, this year's speaker is of the highest caliber and we are honored and privileged that he has accepted the invitation to address us this evening. Dr. Shashi Tharoor's career to date has spanned a variety of roles from author to peacekeeper, refugee worker and human rights activist, former Indian Minister of State for External Affairs and now a member of the Indian Parliament. Educated in India and the United States, he was awarded his PhD as well as the prize for best student in 1978. Following this, he commenced nearly a 30-year stretch with the United Nations. This hands-on and direct experience has equipped him with knowledge, expertise, compassion and empathy. Dr. Tarour has nurtured these qualities and through his award-winning books and articles and other activities has endeavoured to communicate and educate the wider public on issues of globalisation and human rights. On an international level, Dr. Tarour has been a key player in disseminating information about India's impressive transformation and future prospects, India's culture and the country's present and potential influence in world politics. 
He's therefore most qualified to deliver this evening's oration, which is entitled Indian Soft Power in a Globalising World. And so it is with much pleasure that I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to join me in welcoming Dr. Sharaw to deliver the 2011 Institute Annual Oration. Governor Chan, I thank you for that very gracious and I must say very generous introduction. Chairman Johansson, Professor Matu, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I really am very pleased to have this opportunity to address you all uh, in the footsteps of my good friend Kapil Sibyl, but this time on a subject that I've spent a little bit of time thinking about, that of the soft power of India. I've been doing that because of late the focus uh, in our country and around the world when one talks about India. Even the theme of the, the conference that Professor Matu organized till a few days ago, the, the reluctant superpower. Uh, this, this focus has been, perhaps in my view, excessively on, on India's rising power in conventional terms, our, our consistent economic growth in the last couple of decades, uh, the potential of India uh, to have a, a term like superpower reluctant or otherwise applied to it. Uh, the, uh, the frequent references to India as a future world leader. In fact, the American publishers of my 2007 book, The Elephant, the Tiger, and the Cell Phone, even added a gratuitous subtitle, suggesting that my volume was about the emerging 21st century power. Uh, I, I must say, I, I'm troubled by that notion and by that term. I'm not sure that we can yet speak of being a superpower when we are still super poor. We have a lot of internal problems to overcome. Uh, the notion of world leadership in any case is a, is a curiously archaic one. Uh, the very phrase is redolent of Kipling ballads and, and James Bondian adventures. What makes a country a world leader? If it's population, we are on course to top the charts. <laughs> we will uh, overtake China as the world's most populous country uh, the official UN statistic had said 2034. It now seems we will actually pip them to the post at, in 2026. Uh, is it military strength? Well, India is already the world's fourth largest army. Is it nuclear capacity? Well, India's status was made clear in 1998 and then formally recognized in the Indo-US nuclear deal. Is it economic development? Well, there, of course, we know that India has made extraordinary strides in recent years. It's already the world's uh, fifth largest economy in PPP, purchasing power parity terms, and it continues to climb. And in fact, uh, the most recent figure last week from the IMF suggests that in PPP terms, India will actually become the second largest economy, China, I beg your pardon, the third largest economy, second in Asia behind China, because we are likely to overtake Japan by March of 2012. For the the, the ones who are obsessed with exactitude, the reason for this is that Japan's uh, GDP is 4.07 trillion. I think about 4.3 trillion. Uh, India's is 1.3, but when you convert it into PPP terms, that comes to 4.07 trillion. Japan, sadly, after the tsunami and Fukushima, will not grow this fiscal year at all, might even shrink. India will grow. Uh, the government estimates 7.2%. Uh, the IMF somewhat more optimistically estimates in excess of 8% at either figure, then India's 4.7 will exceed Japan's 4.3. So, potentially the third largest economy in the world after the US and China in PPP terms. Yet, as I said, too many of our people still live destitute amidst despair and disrepair. So what is it? What, which of these various elements are we to rely upon in speaking of India as a superpower? That's why I hesitate to use that word. But what I'm happy to talk about is something that in some ways combines all of these elements, but is allied to something altogether more difficult to define. It's soft power. Now, what is then uh, soft power? I think many of you, especially in a university setting, are familiar with the work of my good friend, uh, Joseph Nye at Harvard, who came up with the term uh, just under two decades ago, a decade and a half ago. Um, 
he coined the term really in his first uh, evocation of it to, to describe the extraordinary strengths of the United States, which went well beyond American military dominance. And I argued that power is, after all, the ability to alter the behavior of others to get what you want. And there are three ways to do that. There's coercion, sticks, there's inducements, carrots, and there's attraction, soft power. If you are able to attract others, you can economize on the sticks and the carrots. <laughs> now, traditionally, therefore, power in world politics was seen in terms of military power, right? I mean, the side with the larger army was almost always likely to win right up to the 20th century. But in the recent decades, the last few decades of the 20th century, <laughs> this no longer proved to be enough. After all, the US lost the Vietnam War. The Soviet Union was defeated in Afghanistan. And even in the 21st century, after the fall of Baghdad in 2003, the United States arguably discovered in its first few years there the wisdom of Talleyrand's adage that the one thing you cannot do with a bayonet is to sit on it. <laughs> so in, these, in this context, enter soft power, both as an alternative to hard power and as a complement to it. Let me quote Nye's exact words. The soft power of a country rests primarily on three resources, he wrote. Its culture in places where it's attractive to others, its political values when it lives up to them at home and abroad, and its foreign policies when they're seen as legitimate and having moral authority, unquote. Now, I, I would go slightly beyond this, and Nye has no objection. Uh, I've discussed it with him. A country's soft power, to me, emerges from the world's perceptions of what that country is all about. The associations and attitudes conjured up in the global imagination by the mere mention of a country's name is often a more accurate gauge of its soft power than a dispassionate analysis of its foreign policies. In my view, hard power is exercised. Soft power is evoked. Now for Nye, especially in that first book, the US is the archetypal exponent of soft power. And the fact is that the US is the home of Boeing and Intel, of Google and the iPod, of Microsoft and MTV, Hollywood and Disneyland, McDonald's and Starbucks, in short, of most of the major products that dominate daily life around our globe. The attractiveness of these assets and of the American lifestyle of which they are emblematic is that they permit the US or they help the US to persuade others to adopt the US's agenda rather than relying purely on the dissuasive or coercive hard power of military force. Now, of course, this can cut both ways. In a world of instant mass communications enabled by the internet, Countries are increasingly judged by a global public fed on an incessant diet of internet news, televised images, videos taken on the cell phones of passers-by or tourists, email gossip, the steep decline in America's image and standing uh, with the previous administration after 9-11 is a direct reflection of global distaste for the instruments of American hard power. The Iraq invasion, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, torture, rendition, Blackwater's killings of Iraqi civilians. And those inevitably detracted from all the McDonald's, Starbucks, Intel, iPod, the soft power of America. You remember the outpouring of goodwill for Washington in the wake of 9-11. Think of Le Monde's famous assertion, we are all Americans now. And think of it squandering, really, in the years that followed uh, by what one might argue was America's over-reliance on hard power in its invasion and occupation of Iraq and the related global war on terror. This is instructive, isn't it? Because the existing soft power assets of the US, which were considerable, as Nye had explained a few years previously, clearly proved inadequate to compensate for the deficiencies of its hard power approach. Fans of American culture were not prepared to overlook the excesses of Guantanamo. Using Microsoft Windows does not necessarily predispose you in favor of extraordinary rendition. The misuse of hard power can undermine your soft power around the world. Now, but this discussion today is not about the US, and uh, I don't want to belabor the point. Uh, in fact, in his second book on the subject, The Paradox of American Power, uh, Joseph Nye actually took the analysis of soft power beyond the US. Other nations, too, he suggested, could acquire it. And in today's information era, he wrote, three types of countries are likely to gain soft power 
and so succeed. And as I read this quote from that book, I hope you will think a little bit of India. Those whose dominant, quote, quote, those whose dominant cultures and ideals are closer to prevailing global norms, which now emphasize liberalism, pluralism, autonomy, those with the most access to multiple channels of communication and thus have more influence over how issues are framed, and those whose credibility is enhanced by their domestic and international performance, unquote. Now, at first glance, of course, this seems like a prescription for reaffirming the reality of US dominance. Obviously, one could argue that perhaps no other country scores quite as highly in all three categories as the US does. But now himself admits that soft power has been pursued by other countries uh, with success over the years. When France lost the War of 1870 to Prussia, one of the most important steps it took to rebuild the nation's shattered morale and to enhance its international prestige was to create the Alliance Francaise to promote French language and literature throughout the world as the flagship of France's standing in the globe. French culture has remained a major selling point for French diplomacy ever since. The UK has the British Council, the Swiss have Pro Helvetia, and Germany, Spain, Italy, and Portugal have respectively institutes named for Goethe, Cervantes, Dante Alighieri, and Camus. Today, China has started establishing Confucius Institutes to promote Chinese culture internationally. And the Beijing Olympics, as we all know, have, were a sustained exercise in the building up of soft power by an otherwise hard power-oriented state. The US itself has used officially sponsored initiatives from the Voice of America to the Fulbright Scholarships to promote its soft power around the world. But soft power does not, in my view, rely merely on governmental action. Arguably for the US, to go back to that example, Hollywood and MTV, which have nothing to do with the government, have done more to promote the idea of America as a desirable and admirable society than any official US governmental endeavor like the VOA or Fulbright. Soft power, in other words, is created partly by governments and partly despite governments, partly by deliberate action, partly by accident. So what does all this mean for India? It means acknowledging that India's claims to any sort of significant leadership role in the world of the 21st century lie, and that is my proposition, in the aspects and products of Indian society and culture that the world might find attractive. These assets may not directly persuade others to support India, but they would go a long way toward enhancing India's intangible standing in the eyes of a globalizing world. Now, the roots of India's soft power run deep. India's is a civilization that over millennia has offered refuge and, more important, religious and cultural freedom to Jews, Parsis, several varieties of Christians, and Muslims. Jews came to southwestern Indian, the southwestern Indian coast, where my ancestors hail from, Kerala, centuries before Christ. With the destruction by the Babylonians of the first temple and some uh, oral legend uh, by the, uh, after the destruction by the Romans of the second temple is the other version. Uh, and what is not debated, they knew no incident of persecution on Indian soil. In fact, they're probably the only Jewish diaspora in the world that has not known a single incident of anti-Semitism until the Portuguese arrived in the 16th century to inflict it. Uh, <laughs> At that point, in fact, they moved from the bits of Kerala where they were down to Cochin, where they built one of the most magnificent synagogues in the Jewish world. So if I may recommend your next tourist trip, uh, go and have a look at it. It's extraordinary hand-painted mosaics, all in excellent condition. Christianity arrived in Indian soil with St. Thomas the Apostle, Doubting Thomas. In fact, uh, he came to the Malabar coast sometime uh, around before 52 AD and was welcomed on shore, or so oral legend has it, by a flute-playing Jewish girl. I love, love that image. <laughs> now, he made many converts. So there are Indians today whose ancestors were Christian well before anyone of European descent in this room had an ancestor who discovered Christianity. In Kerala, Islam came through traders, travelers, missionaries, rather than by the sword. So it came actually in the prophet's lifetime because that Arabian Sea had been traversed many times by people traveling from the peninsula. 
In fact, uh, the Zamorin of Calicut, ruling uh, the area called Kojikod in Kerala, was so impressed by the seafaring skills of the Muslims he came across. We had the Kunyali Marikars, who were formidable sailors and, 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 and naval soldiers, that he actually issued a decree obliging every fisherman in his domain to bring up one son as a Muslim because he was convinced only Muslims could sail well. <laughs> and so they had to man his all Muslim navy. He himself was a Hindu. The India, where the wail of the muezzin routinely blends with the chant of mantras of the Hindu temple, and where the tinkling of, of church bells accompanies the Sikh Gurdwara's reading of verses from the Guru Granth Sahib, is an India that fully embraces the world in all its diversity. Indeed, the British historian E.P. Thompson wrote that this heritage of diversity is what makes India, and I'm quoting here, here's to show you, perhaps the most important country for the future of the world. All the convergent influences of the world, Thompson wrote, run through this society. There is not a thought that is being thought in the West or the East that is not active in some Indian mind." Unquote. I'm glad a Brit said that and not an Indian. <laughs> Now, that Indian mind has been shaped by remarkably diverse forces, ancient Hindu tradition, myth and scripture, the impact of Islam and Christianity, and two centuries of British colonial rule, which has given me the language in which I can address you today in Australia. The result is unique. Though there are some who think and speak of India as a Hindu country because it is 81% Hindu, Indian civilization today is an evolved hybrid. We cannot speak of Indian culture today without Kavali, the poetry of Ghalib, or for that matter, the game of cricket, our de facto national sport, none of which were Hindu in origin, much as Indians have liked to think otherwise about cricket. <laughs> There's a wonderful Indian sociologist who wrote that cricket is an ancient Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. <laughs> When an Indian dons national dress for a formal event, he wears a variant of the Sherwani, which did not exist before the Muslim invasions of northern India. In fact, when Indian Hindus voted a couple of years ago in a cynical and contrived competition to select the new seven wonders of the modern world, they voted for the Taj Mahal constructed by a Mughal Muslim king in India and not for Angkor Wat, the most magnificent architectural product of the Hindu religion, which happens to be in Cambodia. So in the breadth and not just the depth of its cultural heritage lies the roots of India's soft power. Now, one of the, the only generalizations that can safely be made about India, and of course, India is a country about which you can never generalize. So I, let me generalize by saying nothing can be taken for granted about the country. And not even its name, because as you know, the name India comes from the River Indus, which flows in Pakistan. <laughs> well. That anomaly is easily explained, of course, since what is today Pakistan was hacked off the stooped shoulders of India by the departing British in 1947. But I mention this only because Indian nationalism is a very unusual phenomenon indeed. In fact, um, the UN, we used to joke about, and this is an apocryphal story, about an argument between an American diplomat and a French diplomat at the Security Council. And the American says, you know how we can solve this particular problem? We can do this and this and this, and we can solve it. And the French diplomat says, yes, 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 that will work in practice, but will it work in theory? <laughs> I'm sure that sounds like some of your political science professors, right? <laughs> but but the, the thing about Indian nationalism is it works exceedingly well in practice, it's done so now for 64 years, but it does